Hello and welcome to the program. I am Deji Badimasi. After a long wait, the Presidential Election Petition Tribunal has finally given its judgment on the election of, that's the presidential election now of 2023. Now, given its verdict, uh, it upheld the victory of President Bola Tinubu in the February 2023 presidential poll. On th now, a five-member panel of the tribunal took turns to dismiss the petitions presented by the People's Democratic Party, Labour Party, and the Allied People's Movement, APM, seeking to nullify President Tinubu's election of uh, February the 25th. The court, in its ruling delivered in Abuja on Wednesday, dismissed the APM's petition for lacking in merit and being incompetent. The court held that since the APM failed to challenge President Tinubu's nomination within the constitutionally allowed period, its case, therefore, had become statute bad, adding that the issue of alleged double nomination of Vice President Kashim Shatima was not a legal ground now for disqualification and that it wasn't proven. Now, for the PDP and Labour Party, the tribunal highlighted their failure, the failure now of their candidates to present concrete evidence to support their cases, adding that oral testimonies and generic allegations were not enough to ground the INEX uh, results. Now, closing the case, Justice uh, Samani, who led the five-man tribunal, said all judgments were delivered based on the understanding of the facts of evidence and submissions of counsel that were presented before the justices. In their reactions, Atiku Abubakar and uh, Peter Obi have uh, rejected the judgment, saying they're heading to the Supreme Court uh, to, of course, that they are appealing against the, the ruling now and, of course, heading to uh, the Supreme Court. So wait and see uh, what happens next uh, and when they are going to file that case. But joining us to discuss the issue further, I have uh, Onyekachu Ubani, who, uh, of course, is a lawyer and used to be an official of uh, the Nigerian Bar Association. We also have Yogunye, who is, uh, of course, a lawyer as well. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on the program. Let me start from you, Mr. Ogunye. Uh, give me your take on you know, that 12-hour judgment now, more than 12 hours, I should say, delivered by, by the, uh, the, 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 the tribunal. Well, thank you, Deji, for inviting me. Um, the judgment, uh, in my own assessment, uh, is a fair judgment. It's a judgment that uh, dealt with all the issues that were raised in the consolidated petitions, uh, namely the APM petition, the Labour Party petition, and uh, the PTP petition, challenging the election of uh, President uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu as the duly elected president of Nigeria. Uh, the judgment dealt with all the issues that were raised including the objections uh, in the petition and rendered a full uh, review of uh, the facts, uh, made finding on the facts and adjudged all the issues and resolved them uh, in most parts mm. uh, in favor of uh, the due conduct of the election and the election of the president and the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I said the most part because some of the issues that are treated by the petition were resolved against uh, the respondent, namely the second respondent mm -hmm. and uh, the political party. Uh, for example, uh, the APC uh, challenged uh, the qualification of uh, Peter Obi uh, the Labour Party uh, flag bearer in the election. And the court, uh, the tribunal, damned uh, them by saying that it's not in their place to question the qualification of Mr. Peter Obi for the election, mm. not being members of that political party, Labour Party. And uh, that issue was an internal affair uh, matter. There was another issue. Uh, that was raised, uh, which was resolved uh, similarly against them. So on the whole, the judgment fairly, as I said earlier, uh, dealt with the issues. Now, 
There are three major grounds of um, challenging an election hmm. under Section 134 and 135 of the Electoral Act uh, 2022. The first is that the person whose election is being questioned was not at the time of the election qualified to contest the election. The second is the invalidity uh, grant, and that's to the fact that uh, the uh, uh, person was not uh, validly elected by a majority of lawful uh, votes uh, in the election. And the third is that, which is indeed the second in the act, is that the uh, election was invalid for reason of non-compliance with the provision of the Electoral Act or for reason of some corrupt practices in the conduct of the election. And uh, the tribunal explored those three grounds. And the tribunal held that first, uh, President Bola Amentinu was qualified uh, to contest the election. In the APM uh, petition specifically, the tribunal ruled that it was a pre-election matter and that the APM ought to have raised that before the election if they wanted to raise it at all, and that the matter was started back. Now, on the second, uh, issue, which is the issue of substantial compliance uh, as provided by Section 135, the tribunal held that uh, the conduct of the election was in substantial compliance with the provision of the Electoral Act and that the election and the conduct thereof weren't marred by alleged malpractices or corrupt practices as to nullify uh, the election. And that on the third, that there was no credible evidence that was led or shown by the petitioner uh, to suggest that the winner uh, was not elected by a majority of lawful votes in the election. That all the allegations uh, that there were massive rigging all over the country uh, were not specified. And so uh, in the lead judgment, uh, you had such words as being nebulous, uh, being specious, being speculative and all that, being used to describe uh, the petition uh, by the tribunal, who came hard on the petition by saying that they were alleging they couldn't prove and they weren't mm. uh, specific, and that those petitions were devoid of particulars and specifics. If you are alleging, for example, as resolved by the tribunal, that there were irregularities or that votes uh, were stolen from you, you must be able to specify, you know, polling booth by polling booth. Uh, and that that threshold was not reached. I know that as far as the issue of uh, election petition jurisprudence is concerned, there is a general consensus that it's very difficult on a national scale to prove that elections are rigged, you know, polling booth by polling booth, uh, that it was a huge or tall task. However, as found by the tribunal, uh, what the tribunal stated was that no attempt was even made to suggest that in one polling booth or the other, you know, uh, or a number of them, there were irregularities. That what you have at the end of the day were but, but general. How, uh, sorry, and sorry if I may interject there. How how could the lawyers how could the lawyers have missed example, that? If, justices, if I may ask, Justice Yusuf, you know, just a moment. One of Justice Justice Yusuf, you know, uh, and this noteworthy stated that for the Labour Party petition that we are asked, the Labour Party claimed that it had about 133,000 agents all over the country. Out of the about 177,000 you could possibly have, since we have about 176,000 plus uh, polling uh, booths and therefore polling agents, he couldn't bring just one polling agent as a witness to testify to the allegation and prove those allegations. Rather, it then depended on, you know, uh, witnesses that more or less, you know, uh, use ARC evidence. And so the tribunal had no difficulty in rejecting uh, 10 witnesses out of the 30 witnesses that the Labour Party had. So um, my view is that the tribunal had judged all the issue, 25% issue, 
raised, you know, the non Okay, uh, ju ju the just hold on there. We're, we're, going, we're going to come back to... We're, we're, I'm going to come back to you. I'm, I'm going to come back to you, Mr. Ogun. Let, let me go to uh, Mr. Obani. Uh, one of the, key, one of the co uh, contending issues before the tribunal was the issue of um, uh, uh, the status of Abuja. Uh, of course, you know, the Labour Party insisted that um, a, a candidate should that it was mandatory for a candidate, a presidential candidate, to get 25% uh, of the vote in Abuja eventually. Uh, and that without getting that, I mean, that a candidate cannot be declared winner of the election, even if the candidate won uh, in other states of the country. But of course, you saw the way the tribunal ruled, uh, saying that that is not the correct interpretation of the Constitution. What, what do you make of that? Yeah, yeah. Uh... Uh, Deji, thank you very much for having me. I I want to start uh, by saying that, uh, before answering that question, that uh, the judicial intervention in our electoral process is uh, actually enshrined in the Electoral Act. Uh, I think this is the last step or the last stage of our electoral process. Started with the election, then, I mean, the registration of voters, then the election proper. The announcement of the election and people who feel aggrieved are entitled by the law to come to court, which is what uh, those petitioners have done. And of course, you you really know the process it under undertook for us to arrive at this uh, stage: the pre-hearing session, the prior proper, and then the judgment that took almost twelve hours, as Riley mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so, those uh, lawyers. And the petitioners, uh, some of them were in court in order to listen to that judgment. And if you feel that any of the judgment that has been given so far by the court uh, is not right, you still have this appellate option to the Supreme Court, uh, which you have to do uh, within the time specified by the electoral act. So we are at that stage at this uh, point in time. Uh, so having listened to the judgment, some of them felt that look, that judgment does not reflect uh, you know, what they have uh, come to court to seek, and that is justice. And they felt that that was clearly uh, below the expectation of what justice means in this election. They have election matter they have brought before the court. So they are going to go on appeal, according to them. Mm. Now, on the issue of uh, Abuja, you know, uh, uh, being a requirement for any president to be validly elected is a constitutional provision. And if you look at that particular section, uh, some of the opinion is saying that the word used here is that you must have 25% in 24 states and and Abuja. And so the literary, uh, the literal interpretation that has been given by many scholars is a look, uh, that particular word and you know is very, very clear and unambiguous. And when a word in a statute is very clear and ambiguous, that it will be absolutely wrong for you to apply any other method of interpretation. And if you, if you listen to that judgment that day in the court, the court also used issue of literal interpretation with issue of witness uh, uh, statement that should be front loaded in accordance with the practice direction. And they said it is witness statement that you must front load, whether it is opinion or ordinary witness. And they use the word that it must be. Uh, a literal inter say shall in a literal interpretation that you don't need to import mm. any other any other meaning to it. No, but when it came to issue of Abuja's interpretation, the court now say that that word and does not reflect that you should use a literal interpretation. That you have to look at the holistic. Well, the, the court made uh, reference to the semicolon that comes after the and as well. That's what I'm saying now that you must now look into another uh, method of interpretation you have to look at the holistic uh, provision of the constitution that applying a literal interpretation will not uh, meet the cause of uh, justice uh, but that is contrary to you know people's opinion that that couldn't have been the proper way of interpreting that section that he used the word and but what what, what, you is, your you what, what is your opinion what is your opinion percent in 24 states and fct abuja and then the, inter the explanation that the court was given and said, why must you assign a special status uh, to Abuja? Some other person will tell you that you have to assign a special status to Abuja because one, that is the federal capital of, uh, that's the capital of the Federal Republic of Nigeria that comprises all other ethnic, ethnic groups must be in that particular environment. And that is where the president himself 
It's almost like the governor. But, but, but I'm, I'm asking you, Mr. Obani, what, what, what is Abuja, your own uh, opinion? On, what is your own opinion on that? What is your own opinion opi on that? My opinion is that the the departure of the court from adopting a literary interpretation and using another method, you know, uh, does not accord with the position of the of the court in other places where they have used literary interpretation where the 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 provision is very clear unambiguous when any provision of a law is clear unambiguous you don't resort to issue of mischief rule you don't resort to any other interpretative method other than the fact that the words that are used they are very clear unambiguous mm -hmm. so that that is two side of opinion over there there are those who said no abuja does not enjoy such a special status as provided there, there are those who say no. There is a special reason why that particular hand is used. And so that's why now the Supreme Court will be the final court that will be able to determine. I mean, you know, when these things happen, people can come, we all talk, you know, over these cases and they probably find excuses to justify. We've seen it in Adele case case on the matter went to Supreme Court and we saw also how the Supreme Court had reached addition. So to me, whatever we are saying here is our own opinion until the final decision of the Supreme Court is. Uh, in is made concerning this decision we can now say this is a precedent that has been finally established and all that so that's why those guys who were there said look they have a right to go on appeal in order to get the final pronouncement of the supreme court on some of the areas they have disagreed on that judge so we we'll wait for the supreme court you know okay. to finally probably take a look at some of their grants of appeal they may likely you know bring before the supreme court let, let me get mr queen let me get your own take uh, and I, I want you to just be very brief what's your take on this controversy over the 25 percent and and the way the court ruled on it well i think that that matter ought not to have been put before the court for adjudication i'm a lawyer uh, and there are many lawyers in this country it used to be said that Lawyers are like people who look at an elephant and start describing the elephant in various ways no, I don't agree. There is certainty in the law. Lawyers and judges rely on precedents. They rely on the rules of interpretation to fairly state the law. As a matter of fact, no lawyer will be worth his wig if he were to say, until there is litigation, he cannot advise on the subject. When a client briefs you, a lawyer, by the rules of professional ethics, is expected to believe in the cause of his client. And so, the duty thereby implied is that he forms an opinion. That's why lawyers give opinions on legal matters. Okay? And that is on the basis of that, that it will go to the court. Mm. Lawyers don't go to court to conduct or participate in a moots and mock trial. These are real life issues, and that's why it is said that the courts do not treat academic matters but life issues. There is no rational lawyer in this country who did not have a good idea of what the position of the law is on that 25% before that petition was submitted to the court. So it was a fishing a needless fishing expedition. And lawyers do this often in this jurisdiction, claiming that they are growing the law, and yet they are, they are improving on the rule of law. And that's not how to improve on the rule of law. And that's why, in my view, the court was very justified in deprecating not just the petitioners, but the lawyers mounting this. Okay? Just Roka Yusuf said that unfortunately those who are orchestrating that argument were people who are supposed to know better i'm paraphrasing my lord on that point it, it was a it was a needless argument that abuja will have to be treated specially if you don't have uh 25 of the vote in abuja then you are not uh duly elected now, since we are operating of a federation, would they say that if a gubernatorial candidate who is elected does not have a 25% in his capital, he won't be deemed to have been elected or in the local government? 
I mean, what kind of air splitting argument is that? Lawyers play too much in this jurisdiction. All right. And so, for people who are now saying that the judgment is riddled with technicalities, judges are judge reliefs that are put forward by litigants. If a litigant raises a plethora of technical issues, not on the substance, what do you think the court will do? The court will adjudge such technical matters. And in turn now, the court will then be accused of reeling out technicalities in the judgment. I think that it was a sorry all right, argument. All right. I, I'm, I'm still so going to come back to you. Let, let, okay. I'm, I'm still going to come back to you. Thank you very much. Let, let's, let's take on another issue now, Mr. Obani, and which was also a very contentious one. The issue of the transmission of um, our results, you know. Of course, you, you heard what INEC said. INEC said it had a glitch. That's why it could not transmit uh, results uh, real time now to uh, the IRF. It's, it's IRF server. I mean, this is not about the beavers. The beavers was used. But what we're talking about here is uh, the non-transmission, uh, real time transmission of uh, uh, results now to the IRF server. You saw how uh, the, the tribunal ruled on that, uh, saying that, you know, it, it's not mandatory for INEC to uh, uh, transmit uh, results um, to, to the IRF server, that it's, it's not a mandatory requirement. Uh, what, what's your take on the way uh, the, the, the tribunal looked at and, and dealt with that issue? Now, with regards to uh, what uh, you have asked about the issue of uh, transmission, you remember that we amended the Electoral Act uh, in 2022. Mm. And part of the you know, novel provision of that particular act was this issue of uh, transmission of the result by INEC to the IREF. And, and that, again, took a lot of argument uh, both on the floor and even with members of the, of the CSO. Uh, the civil society group and the National Assembly when they were given excuse why we cannot in any way engage in that uh, venture of electronic transmission or eventually they succumb to it. And then the act itself gave INEC, the act itself gave INEC the power to enact their guidelines that will guide the electoral process. Mm. Now that is very key. And so whatever INEC will do is all governed by the act. The act gives them that power, and in doing that, they are not under any person's authority or any person's uh, power or control. So INEC went ahead to enact the guideline through which they, they actually ran the process. You know, in 2023, of course, this issue of beavers and the manner of coming to vote, how the result of it is INEC yeah. guideline that ran that process. And INEC went out to promise that they will ensure that there's going to be transmission of this result to ensure transparency because the purpose we spent all that money and gave INEC all the billions we did, you know, is to ensure that the electoral process is free credible, that the whole world will accept that this is actually the method and better way of choosing and recruiting leadership. Mm -hmm. So INEC failed big time in transmitting the result of Federal House of Reps, that of the Senate. But when it came to the presidency, INEC failed big time. And when asked, INEC was talking about glitches. Now, the, the act, I mean, the court itself in making pronouncement on that ground said no, that INEC was not under any mandatory uh, 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 provision of the law uh, to transmit and saying that there was no uh, provision in the Electoral Act. And it's asked, what, what is the court saying concerning provision? There is already a provision that gave INEC the power to enact guidelines. And based upon that act, Based upon that provision of the act, INEC enacted a guideline to guide the process. And part of their uh, uh, this thing is that they will ensure that they will transmit electronically the results. And so if INEC now failed to do that, a very active court will say, no, INEC, you have no right to have departed from your guideline because you made this particular guideline to guide the process. So why didn't you? And for doing that, 
there must be you know some level of pronouncement made by the court you know in order can to I, ensure can I, can that I we depart ask... from the old way mm. that we were doing things electronic i mean manually that made people to manipulate results that made people to carry ballot boxes because the pro purpose of electronic you know transmission and the digitization of the process was to ensure fairness and credibility now if you now argue that uh, there was no pro express provision you are we, are we are going back to the period before 2022 when that amendment was made and that is not healthy for us in our electoral journey in the country because we're encouraging the manual way of doing things and then this issue of manipulative method this issue of not having transparency enshrined in our process that will still make us to be fighting and killing one another all in a bid to elect our leaders and so that judgment again is something that the supreme court has to make a pronouncement whether it was right for what INEC did, you know, in order to disobey their own guideline and get away with it without any pronouncement by, by the court, without any scouting remark made against them, you know, that the court approved. And so there was no law that was enacted in the Electoral Act. I don't think that would be the correct position, you know, based upon all that money we have spent in organizing the elect new Electoral Act and even organizing the election proper. Do, do you think the non-transmission real time of, of the results actually vitiated the entire process? And rendered not the, issue of the, not not issue of vision now is issue of ensuring transparency you know look at what happened in most of the elections that were held before this general election before those elections were concluded you know uh, announced people already knew because they were following online you know all those you know transmitted results from the polling unit and calculating it so that if you now come up with a different result from what you have in your system, somebody can fault you and say, no, in this polling unit, this is what was transmitted and not this. But we saw even in the IRA all manner of manipulative, uh, you know, but, record, but, erase but what records was, and all let, that. Let me ask that you is this. not the purpose. Because what was wrong? Time, they have manipulated the results mm. and they not transmit from the polling unit. They now went somewhere to manipulate some of the results that we are seeing that were not clear. On the now, on the, now on let, the IRA, let, let me ask. after they have done what let, they have done with the result, let not me transmitting ask. from the polling unit mm. real time after announcing the result. So those manipulations came after the results have been announced at the polling unit, and they did not transmit immediately from the polling unit. Because that time, people will follow up and calculate and be sure of the transparency of the system. The transparency of the system is very key. Can because I, INEC can cannot I, depart from a thing okay. that is already in the system. Can, but can they I, departed from that, I, and that is why we're having some of the arguments we had and others. So let's not clap for INEC for departing from their own guideline. At least a remark should have been made that, look, there is money spent on all this. There is reason behind the issue of having transmission done. Why didn't you do it? And we're not giving them a pat on the back and saying, for glitches, you know, they can, they were, there's no law mandating them. When the law says you can enact your guideline, and they enacted the guideline saying, we're going to do this. And they departed from doing that. And we're clapping for them and say they have done the right thing. No, that is not the way to go for us as a all nation. All right, okay. That's not the way. All right. Uh, Mr. Ogunye, can I get your take on this? Well, is uh, all the arguments, not by my learned friend, but all the contention in the public space about uh, the requirement of uh, immediate transmission of uh, the results as they have been uh, announced at the polling booths all over the country to IREF for public viewing and for ascertainment is all sand and foolish signifying nothing. And I say this with us due respect. First, it's not a constitutional requirement. Second, the INEC, the Electoral Act, also does not command it. Albeit, the Electoral Act says that INEC can set regulation for itself. And so INEC set a regulation, unfortunately, the dictates of the regulations weren't uh, carried out you know, immediately so that the results were not contemporaneously uh, transmitted, as it is said, like a simultaneous equation. Uh, just as results are being announced, immediately they will be transmitted and all that. And now, which is more critical, was it the contention of the petitioners that when the results were eventually published, the results that were there didn't tally with the results given to their polling agents. No! So I can't see the wood from the trees. So what is the argument all about? It's like a failing football team saying that because scores were not immediately 
posted on a dashboard at a stadium. And that the people in that stadium did not see the result on the screen. Then they've not been defeated. I mean, that, that's nonsensical. Or it's like suggesting, for example, again, which is a very uh, illustrative example, that because the judgment that had just been delivered by the tribunal was not transmitted live as it was being delivered, therefore, the judgment was wrong or the judgment was not delivered. It was a fake judgment. I mean, I, mean, I said, these arguments are lazy arguments. They are lazy arguments. I understand that INEC imposed that duty on itself and overpromised because it wanted to improve on the transparency and credibility of the election. And that's a good thing. Moving forward, INEC in the future should keep all its promises as much as possible. But to insist that the non-immediate transmission of those results nationwide to that portal, to that IRF, vitiated the election, showed that the election had been rigged, showed that it had been manipulated on beavers and all that, and they were using this interchangeably, beavers, IRF, and all that, is a lazy argument. And that, that, that's why I say, they, they, we had my practices in that election. I wasn't happy about it. I wish that those malpractices could be brought forward in an election petition determination more accurately, more mm. cogently, more credibly, so that they could weigh on the minds of judges. But to then be picking stro at straws and to be insisting that these are tangible planks on which to rest a case of an allegation of widespread electoral malpractice or to call for a nullification of an election, I think that is, is, is just nonsensical. Don't you think that the tribunal should have at least said something about INEC not transmitting the results, just as um, Mr. Obani said, that, that you know, the, the tribunal should at least have probably maybe scolded INEC or at least said something about, you know, along that line that INEC failed <laughs> in, in, in its promise? They you will answer the question first as a lawyer and then general as a citizen. citizen. Mm -hmm. Judges are permitted to address all material issues in their judgment. And the fact that the judgment does not cover all the issues raised before a court of law will not vitiate the judgment. Except you can show on appeal that the issue that had been left unaddressed was so material to the determination of that case and that its not consideration had, you know, occasioned a miscarriage of justice, that judgment would be a good judgment. Now, as a citizen, I would say that I'm not the court. I'm not the tribunal members. I didn't help them to write their judgment. They were the master, the alpha and omega of all the issues that they raised and addressed in that court. If it is said that the judge or their lordships, uh, the judges of the Court of Appeal, who determined that those petitions didn't, you know, spank INEC for not transmitting, I would say, what does it matter? They addressed the issue of non-transmission and they rested it by saying that that non-transmission does not vitiate the election and that IRF is not a collation center. The collation was done nationwide, physically on the ground, from polling booth to collation center, local government, statewide, and then to the national collation center. That's how they resolved the matter. And I have no uh, strong reservation or any reservation about how they resolved uh, the matter. If anybody was looking for a whip, uh, you know, that the justices will wield to trash INEC and they didn't see one. Well, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that they didn't see the whipping okay. hand of their lordships. And I'm just saying this, you know, uh, like a literal joke. But Ms. it's Mr. a serious Barry. matter. Address all the issues that were jamming, that were material, and they resolved all these issues. They left no stone unturned, and they left no turn unstoned. I'm satisfied with the judgment. Mr. Bani, what would be your final word on this?
Yeah, uh, Deji, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think uh, with the amendment we've done on the Electoral Act, uh, what we'll be expecting uh, with uh, our judiciary is to also follow with time in order to live up to the idea, to the motive, uh, to the sentiment, you know, behind most of these amendments so that we don't go back to the earlier era where we carry all the burdens and place upon the petitioner to go and produce all the witnesses, you know, from uh, the entire federation, all the polling unit agents to come and prove. Uh, there has been an enhancement, you know, in the method of proof, especially on documentary evidence. And if it comes from INEC as certified, you don't begin to call all the witnesses again. Because with the Sorry, does it surprise you that... Election. Does it surprise you that the petitioners did not provide even one uh, witness now? I mean, uh, polling uh, um, agents now from, from, from the polling unit, none. If, of course, if you make allegation against uh, irregularity in a, poll, a polling unit, you must produce the polling unit agent to come and uh, back up whatever you have uh, said. But remember that the court started by throwing away all the written statements on oath of most of the of the witnesses if you remember and then a lot of uh, documentary evidence also we are not uh, we are not permitted you know the court said oh you did the subpoenaed witnesses we are not uh, front loaded and for that purpose they are all struck out and most of their statements in that case also was struck out based upon the fact that these were replies you not know, that raised new issues and all that so these are issues that may probably be resolved in the Supreme Court by those who want to go on appeal, saying that those witnesses that you remove all their statements and all that made left the entire thing as bare. There was nothing again for the court to decide, even on those other, you know, statements that were very relevant to their case. So we want to see these things being resolved by the Supreme Court. But what I'm trying to say is that we must try as much as possible to ensure that we look at our set of our law. And then judiciary must also have the same spirit of amended law in order for us to move forward. Because the method used the burden that is placed of competition and no petitioner will ever, you know, be able to prove any, any, any case they bring before the court on electoral matter, especially when you have been defeated and the, the process is flawed and you want to go to court. They say go to court knowing fully that it will be an impossible task for you to convince any court to obtain the judgment. So I think that something has to be done in order to enhance the the reduction of a burden upon the petition and make these things to be clearer, you know, for those who want to probably go to court tomorrow because it's making people to lose confidence in our judicial system to resolve electoral issues. And that cannot be something that is held in the system. That's my take. And I'm advising that we must, you know, move forward a bit. We'll be rejoicing today because you're on the winning side. Tomorrow you may be on the losing side. I discovered that it wasn't easy for any petitioner based upon that judgment that was delivered uh, two days ago to prove any, any early electoral malpractice based upon the burden of proof that is placed upon the petitioner. Mr. Okunye, your final word? Well, I think that um our country should look forward to a day and a time and a season when our tribunal will not be inundated with election petition election should be a pro sake matter you know free and fair credible and then the losers will admit that they've lost and the winners uh, will be congratulated and then they will be mandamus in victory but now, you know, election petition in the legal profession has become a big issue, you know, uh, and it's an anomaly, but it's now acquired, uh, it's become the norm. After every election cycle, uh, there will be big jobs for lawyers, they will trunk the tribunals and all that. I, I envision a situation in which tribunal will be set up and then they will just have small or little, you know, few petitions to deal with and all the judges will go to their normal jurisdiction and do their jobs you know insofar as we continue to have this we will be strengthening the notion that election will remain inconclusive even after winners have been declared until they are validated by the court our courts are not the validating authority for election in that manner they adjudicate disputes, including electoral disputes on this occasion, but that that shouldn't just be the place that we have to go, you know, after every election, because it eats all the polity and it can be a distraction. I know 
However, that perhaps this serves a therapeutic uh, function after a hotly contested election uh, is better for those who have not accepted defeat mm. to still have access to our courts, to our tribunal, so that they can heal throughout that process. If that is the uh, function the courts are performing on this occasion, perhaps people can say that that's okay, that it's better for them to go to the tribunal than to have chaos on our streets. But that said, I think that we should encourage a situation in which INEC will be at its best conducting an election and that the election will be so open and transparent and credible that even if somebody is loss averse, he doesn't want to take loss at all, the person can be persuaded that he's been defeated in an election and won't have recourse uh, to the courts. Yeah. Some of our lawyers uh, may not agree with me because he's is is become like a major and a chief, you know, brief segment of legal profession in Nigeria, and it's awash with money. Can you imagine the kind of money that we pay to all the lawyers, you know, you know, on both sides and all that, including the appellate process and all that? And can you also imagine, because our data support this conclusion, the kind of temptation? some of our judges will be exposed to, why would we need to continue to tempt them when we can conduct election, you know, basically well and then save them? Because in this country, you know, judges I, I at, of the point. appellate level, justices in the Aqua Ibom election uh, petition fallout of 2004 were removed, two of them, dismissed from the bench. And we've seen other judges being dismissed on account of election petition. So we need to save ourselves all this trouble. And I, right. I look forward to a day when we'll have an election in Nigeria without having recourse uh, uh, to the court. In the right. United States of America, the Alan Gore issue until Trump came and inundated the courts uh, with all his cases in order to steal the election in the United States was an exception. That was not the rule. But it's now like we in Nigeria, we just have to end it this is there. the rule that after every election, mm. the next stage we is the tribunal. I think that All right. uh, we, we, have we just to have to end it there. I, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for democracy. Better. Yes, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming on the program. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Obani. The danger of allowing the judiciary to determine our electoral dispute. I delivered that lecture in South Africa recently. Try mm. to Google and read it. Honestly, it's a summary I, of what he has just I, said. I, here. I, I, I share thank the you. same sentiments as well. And, and to be candid, I think African politicians do need to learn to concede uh, defeat and accept it when, when they lost the election. It's, it's dangerous, just as you've said. It, it's not a good one when we, we continue to approach uh, the courts. Uh, well, but then the courts are there, so we just have to use them. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Thank you so very much for your time, Mr. Uh, Monde Ubani. Uh, thanks for your, for your contributions. And Mr. Jitio Gunye, thank you also for your contributions. Well, we'll take a short break now, and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Don't go away. Opinions are free. Facts are sacred. The truth is universal. How, in practical terms, can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? President must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad Basin, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa Forest. On DG360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion facts and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. The new Nigeria is possible, the future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go any governor to look for grant for ranching. Digi360, dissecting the issues.